being a speaker at this uh, seminar series is, I mean, it means a lot to me personally. Uh, when I was an undergrad back in 2006, seven, I've been meaning to learn about HCI, but I didn't really have that many resources. So I had to rely on online resources and uh, this uh, seminar series recordings have been posted online. And I've, I think I've watched pretty much everything to really you know, learn about HCI. And then I came as a master's student here um, in 2008 and took 547 pretty much for the entire two years I was here. And now I feel great that I you know, get a chance to um, speak uh, as a speaker. Um, so this is great. Uh, today I want to talk about interaction-centric AI. Uh, this is a reprise of the uh, NeurIPS uh, keynote talk that I gave uh, two weeks ago in front of thousands of AI researchers. Uh, I tried to reframe it a little bit so that it's uh, more customized for an HCI audience uh, rather than an AI audience. Uh, but the idea is that I want to you know, think about using human AI interaction uh, at the center of developing AI technologies. And of course, I don't have to preach to the choir that human AI interaction actually matters. Uh, but like diving deeper uh, based on my experience of building these interactive systems in different contexts like education, discussion, decision making. I want to kind of dive deeper and report some of the detailed interactions that we've been uh, uh, observing and, and learning from and think about you know, what it means to design human AI interaction uh, in various contexts and what are some uh, action items uh, moving forward as a community. So let's first start with some definitions and terms. I would say the you know, dominant paradigm for developing AI technologies has been model centric. The idea is to build a model with high accuracy and we want to evaluate it against unseen examples for its generalizability. Uh, and benchmarks have been great in that they could uh, help us competitively uh, compare different models performances which could be uh, useful in making science, scientific advances possible. And more recently, people have been talking a lot about data-centric AI, where the idea is using this you know, nicely performing model, uh, what is a good sort of uh, robust and efficient data pipeline around it in terms of collection of the data, processing of it, cleaning of it, so that uh, the model actually performs really well in different contexts. And here the focus is acquiring uh, quality data and setting the pipeline in a way that really uh, helps the machine perform its best. And you know, these two uh, paradigms are great, uh, but then what is slightly missing is the user who's uh, using these AI technologies and those who are affected uh, by what the AI systems give you. So interaction-centric AI is sort of uh, my term in some contrast to model-centric and data-centric AI, where the goal would be basically what HCI researchers uh, do uh, in this context, like improving the user experience by building uh, usable and useful applications. And uh, the unit that we often grapple with uh, is a human AI interaction. And you might be wondering, so is this some sort of like marketing term? Like how is it different from human-centered, human-centric AI we've been talking all about? Uh, it's largely similar, so I'm not trying to say I invented this new term or anything, uh, but I want to you know, focus our attention to the interaction that is happening between humans and AI and the complex relationships and the dynamics that are happening between the two, rather than focusing on just uh, the humans or machine alone. So, and say that that's sort of the focus of where my sort of discussion will be today. So let's say you're this uh, you know, AI researcher uh, and your team has you know, built this amazing model. Uh, so this is actually you know, something that I copied and pasted from uh, one of the uh, diffusion models papers. I don't know what they actually mean. Uh, some of them I understand. Uh, but basically this is what you have uh, as an AI uh, researcher. But what would a person using this kind of AI want to do with it? Here's an example. Uh, so this is a Twitch streamer in South Korea who was trying to use uh, this diffusion-based uh, text-to-image generation model to uh, create this image of an animated character uh, eating ramen with chopsticks with noodles around uh, the character. So this is the, the roughly sketched out goal that the user currently has. And he ended up spending two hours uh, fiddling with 
text-based prompt to get at the final image that he wants. Um, and this is you know, somewhat similar to what Manish shared a couple of weeks ago at the HAI conference in terms of uh, what he had to do uh, with the uh, prompt-based interface. And here, the entire two-hour journey was live streamed. Um, so I want to kind of uh, share a quick summary of what happened uh, in that stream. And of course, we need something in the middle to bridge between the technology uh, and the human user. And that's what we have, the prompt-based um, interface and interaction that's happening between the two. So the streamer started by something simple and obvious. Uh, the prompt says, eating ramen. And this is what he got. It's OK. It's kind of there. The, but the bowl is perhaps too large. The chopsticks are oddly placed. And he uh, heard from somewhere that you know, adding a full sentence might make things better. So he goes, she is eating ramen. Uh, she is eating ramen for sure, but you know, you can see that something's not quite right. Um, so he keeps going on by adding more descriptions. And the, the prompt is definitely uh, getting longer. Um, and it seems that the uh, AI is not quite getting uh, how chopsticks should be used and like how many uh, should be used. So he keeps adding these descriptions to really explain what it means to use chopsticks. Um, and, <laughs> so, and, and like, to be, to be fair, uh, you know, there's hair, there's chopsticks, there's noodles. So it's uh, in like computer graphics, like dealing with human hair, I heard is a really tough challenge. And maybe for AI, it's also kind of struggling to deal with all these uh, similar looking objects. And it doesn't really seem to get what, uh, how to uh, differentiate between chopsticks and, and noodles. And another interesting aspect was that since it was a live stream, uh, the viewers were actively participating uh, in like uh, recommending new prompts to try out, sharing their interpretations. And this is so, somewhat of a collaborative uh, mental model construction process, if you will, right? As a, as a group of people, they are really trying to figure out what's going on. And now the prompt is like five, five lines long. And this is, uh, the service that the streamer was using was supporting uh, variations, where you could you know, pick an image and say, create some variations. And he was referring to this interaction as variation gacha. So gacha is a Japanese word for like a random box or blind box. And this kind of tells us that how unpredictable uh, this sort of interface is. Right? Once you hit the generate button, the user doesn't really have a good sense of knowing what to expect. And this is the actual stream, as you can see, like his praying and which also uh, tells us about the usability of this sort of system. The, he doesn't have a good way of knowing what to expect so that he actually has to pray. After two hours of hard work, uh, this is a final image that uh, he landed in, and it looks pretty good and he claims victory. But then look at what he had to do uh, at the top, right? There are seven lines of prompt that he had to write. And arguably, this is natural language. Um, but I would say this is really pseudo natural language. Um, and so this is basically the experience that he had to go through. So is this a good interface? And I uh, sort of got inspired by Manish's discussion of discussing the usability of these text uh, prompt based interfaces. Uh, there are some good elements, right? It's quite intuitive. You can use natural language, or you, you believe natural language could be used. And the output is uh, presented in a visual manner, which helps you kind of understand whether you got the image that you like or not, so that you can sort of debug. And there are some interactions uh, that are supported, like variations and seeds and like uh, uh, words that should not be used and things like that. But there are many ways in which this interface actually fails to support what the actual user wants. Uh, he had to rely on trial and error. And the, just the fact that he had to spend two hours to get that image seems to suggest that something is really wrong. And of course, it was not really predictable. And lack of specific feedback on the effect of you know, what specific words in the prompt had uh, influence on the final outcome. These links were often missing, which made it really difficult. So is this really just a problem for these you know, text-based, uh, prompt-based systems? I would say every AI application faces these interaction challenges. On the user side, when they first encounter these systems, they often have to struggle to kind of figure out how to make it work. Often people uh, resort to misusing it, abusing it, and learning takes a long time. 
And it's part of it is really a design challenge. And we've seen other examples like this where people don't have a good sense of what's happening in this algorithmically uh, generated systems and AI powered systems. Like in the uh, famous st uh, study of Facebook newsfeed users, more than half of the participants were not aware of the newsfeed curation algorithm's existence at all, which is far from being true. And on the right, what you see is in the uh, pathology, pathologist's uh, diagnosis uh, scenario, uh, often they would rely on some notion of similarity. Uh, so there are these algorithms that are designed to help people find similar images, uh, but then a, the, the realization that the researchers had was that you know, people had different notions of similarity. So a singular notion of similarity that was used in building an algorithm would not really suffice. So what they ended up doing was to uh, support three different types of similarity interaction, and the user was able to kind of transition between these different terms in a fluid manner, which really gives uh, more control and agency on the user side. And these, you know, put in a more simple sort of diagram manner, whether you are a creator, or Facebook user, pathologist, you seem to have some kind of a mental model of how the system works, a very sort of a classical sort of gap between what the user wants and the system wants. And obviously the system is not behaving in a way that you really want. And this gap arguably seems to be larger with these more complex black box and you know, deep learning based systems. And AI community has been tackling this problem as well. And you know, some of the folks have been uh, you know, framing this as an alignment problem which uh, is about aligning the model's uh, behavior with human intent. And for example, the famous uh, Ch ChatGPT and the uh, InstructGPT paradigm has been sort of OpenAI's response to the alignment problem, where their idea is, uh, in addition to the you know, basic large language model that they have, they would add this fine tuning layer with human feedback which often involves asking people uh, whether you know, they were happy with the results they got. And uh, the system kind of uses that feedback to train a reinforcement learning agent to uh, do the fine tuning so that the resulting text uh, aligns better with what the user wants and they were seeing some success around it. And a quote from the paper is that making language models bigger does not inherently make them better at following a user's intent. And aligning language models with user intent on a wide range of tasks by fine tuning with human feedback. And of course, there's been a lot of discussion about whether this is really the, the most promising way to you know, involve humans or alignment problem, but I think this is some progress towards that direction. But all of these examples, I would say, uh, basically lead us to revisit uh, these classical notions of gulf of execution and gulf of evaluation proposed by Don Norman back in the 1980s, right? Uh, as a user, they want to know what's going on with the system and they want to have more control and agency. And on the evaluation side, when AI gives you some kind of result, they want to be able to understand it, interpret it, and, and want to get some explanation of it. And as an HCI researcher who's building these interactive systems, I feel like in often cases, I try to bridge these gaps. I come up with new ways of designing these you know, social interactions and human AI interactions in a way that tries to bridge these gaps. And these are just some of the systems that I've been developing in different uh, application domains. And I think many of them have somewhat succeeded uh, in bridging these gaps, but other times, to be honest, we haven't done a good job of doing that. Um, so what I wanna do uh, for the remaining uh, time for this talk is to share some of these lessons and some of them from like positive experiences, uh, but other times like bitter experiences by something that we haven't really done a good job of. And the main message that I want to send across is that beyond these point solutions for you know, this system that works in this particular context, we've seen some success. I think as a field, we really need to uh, start thinking about, can we do something more systematic and sustainable? or empower designers and developers in thinking about uh, can, can we develop these AI applications that are more usable and useful for more groups of people rather than uh, you know, having to reinvent the wheel each time someone has to develop these applications. And I think we're seeing too many of these cases where people are like, uh, there's this cool model, let's build something around it. 
and it just gets released in a few days and realizes that people want it in a completely different way, people abuse it, a few days later it goes down. We're seeing too many of these failure cases. Uh, so from the HTI point of view, I think uh, HTI research can really advance this uh, you know, uh, interaction-centric AI by contributing these generalizable building blocks for designing these systems and interface affordances. And AI research can also advance by embracing the idea of interaction-centric AI uh, by rethinking uh, models, architecture design, benchmarks, metrics, and research process. The part of it has to involve sort of broadening the perspective uh, beyond just thinking about the model and the output that it generates to think about the users uh, behind those and their mental models. And often there's not just a single user, but a you know, group of user, community of user, a society of users. And there's also the temporal dimension, like before the user comes in and uh, tries to use the system, we should be asking the questions about like, what's the task and who are these users and why and how. And during the interaction, we need to be thinking about presentation, visualization, and uh, the other way around as well, like interpretable results are being presented to the user. Do they have a way to provide feedback to the system? And also, it's never going to be just a single use, right? People would want to come back and use the system for a sustained amount of time. In those cases, people's mental model would evolve. And what does it mean for the system? And so I think this is sort of the ecosystem that I uh, have in mind. And with these, I want to dive into um, these specific uh, examples uh, where we designed human AI uh, interactions. Uh, and I identify four major challenges in terms of human AI interaction. The first one is about bridging the accuracy gap. So I'm on my sabbatical now. I'm working uh, with this startup called Ringle, where they are basically Uber for language learning. They are matching uh, tutors and tutees, and they have this video-based uh, language tutoring session. So what we try to do here is to build this uh, diagnostic service based on analyzing the chat-based uh, tutoring session to give people like personalized feedback and suggestions for improvement. Um, but instead of going into the details of the service itself, I want to touch upon the uh, case that we ran into when we were trying to run this automated speech recognition AI, which is crucial in sort of turning the video-based chat into text format. Uh, which is really required for us to run all these uh, diagnostic algorithms on top of. And the standard metric of success uh, in ASR uh, would be word error rate, you know, how correctly it can sort of, uh, recover the original text. And on the tutor side, when we ran uh, ASR on like hundreds and thousands of sessions, the average word rate, uh, error rate was around 8%. Uh, can you take a guess as to what the number would have been uh, for students? Obviously, there's this white uh, margin that's quite um, high, so uh, you can imagine. 30. Yeah, we're seeing 23. Um, so there's quite a bit of a gap. And this is an example of an accuracy gap where different groups of users are getting disproportionate uh, results from the same AI. And the gap actually widens if we look at like the best tutor and the, the worst uh, student when it comes to the performance of these models. But in terms of thinking about the interaction that these people are trying to have with this AI, I would argue that the, the students are the ones who really need this AI to work, right? Based on the accuracy of this AI, they want to kind of look at where they you know, succeeded and failed and they want to learn and reflect. And with this uh, you know, low accuracy, they would really be struggling uh, to come up with good you know, action items. And they might be frustrated. They might lose trust in the system. But interestingly, a lot of focus when it comes to model development is that we seem to be focusing on the 6%, like making this 6% better instead of narrowing the gap between 6 and 36%. And we have to really be asking, like, what is the most important question in this context? And are we really focusing on the most important question? And we see these other examples, too, uh, where you know, Tyra and others have studied uh, the machine translation that is being used in emergency rooms when it comes to dis discharge statements that are presented to patients and patients' families. 
and we see a huge disparity between different languages. And in the uh, natural language processing uh, community, this uh, support for low, low resource languages has been a uh, you know, topic for research and there has been great efforts. And on the right is a famous example of gender shades where the, the uh, gender uh, classification algorithm shows again uh, an accuracy uh, disparity between a uh, darker, darker skinned female versus lighter scale uh, male. And of course, these uh, diversity and inclusion efforts and low resource language support research in the AI community, NLP community, have been tackling these issues of accuracy gap, of course. Uh, but then I would argue that they could you know, advance further by embracing more interaction-centric approach in trying to really see how in, in the real world people are interacting with these results and what kind of actual struggles that they have because of you know, poor or good AI uh, accuracy and what, what, as a community, how can we define the problem that's uh, most important. And conceptually speaking, I feel like a good analogy might be the ceiling and floor analogy. The ceiling would be this primary user group uh, you know, who gets the best part of AI. Uh, and floor would be sort of you know, secondary user group who uh, is dispro disproportionately getting more negative impact of uh, the same AI. And there's this accuracy gap. And often I feel like taking a model-centric approach incentivizes uh, you know, people and researchers to work on raising the ceiling. There, co there could be a couple reasons for this, right? First of all, that's the SOTA number you get, which might be what you need to publish a paper out of it. Or the benchmarks that you're working with do not really have much data uh, on, the, on the floor side. It's maybe more focused on the ceiling side. And that's why the ceiling is there in the first place, right? So it might be just incentivizing uh, people to continue to push the boundaries of ceiling. And as a, as a result, what we see is somewhat of a widened accuracy gap. And if we take a more interaction-centric approach, I would argue that if we identify that narrowing this gap is a more important problem, uh, we can uh, narrow this accuracy gap. And it's not just a matter of accuracy, if you think about it. It's about experience, benefit, and value that people get out of uh, interacting with this AI. So there was a first challenge about uh, the accuracy gap and how thinking about how people interact uh, with this AI can help us identify what problems are worth tackling. And second of all, I want to talk about when people actually use AI. And one of the uh, anti-patterns of human AI interaction is that people just stop using AI altogether or abandon it, which is something you might want to avoid uh, as a uh, system designer. And, and that's why it's important to think about how do we incentivize people to work with uh, AI. And in most cases, people abandon using AI because it's not really giving them concrete value that they expect. And we explore this in the context of online education in this system called Access. So the problem that we wanted to focus here is that in online, let's say you want to learn some new concept like probability, there are lots of problems and answers you can find. But finding good explanations is surprisingly difficult. And generating high quality explanations is costly and resource intensive and so on. So we wanted to tackle this problem uh, by building this uh, online education uh, platform where uh, people are presented uh, with a problem and they solve this problem, they submit an answer, and they see an example that's presented by the system and they get a chance to rate how helpful the explanation that they saw was. And then they are uh, getting a chance to sort of self-explain uh, their own uh, answer. So this is a pedagogically meaningful activity to be able to sort of explain your thought process, externalize it, and lots of research supports uh, doing self-explanation. Okay, so fairly simple sort of uh, front end in terms of the learner experience. So what's happening uh, behind the scene is that the system is collecting these explanations and ratings uh, from learners, right? Since it's a live system, uh, new learners keep coming in and you know, provide new ratings and explanations. And we formulate this in a multi-armed bandit manner, which means that as a new explanation comes into the system, as a byproduct of humans' learning activity, a new arm gets added to the system. 
And what the system is doing is to determine this sort of dynamic policy for what the most effective explanation would be for the next learner coming into the system. So if you're familiar with the reinforcement learning um, of concepts, uh, we are navigating exploitation and exploration trade-off. Exploitation in the sense that the system wants to present the best explanations to the next learner coming into the system, but the system doesn't really know what the best explanations are until it collects some amount of ratings from people. So it has to do some exploration where it should collect uh, these data. And to solve that, we use a technique called Thompson sampling. So what happens is uh, the system keeps track of these policies, and when a new explanation comes in and ratings come in, uh, these things get updated, and the policy, uh, uh, probabilistic uh, policy gets updated so that it uses this distribution to determine what explanation to, the sh to show to the next learner. So when we ran a study, uh, these access generated explanations were helpful in terms of helping people learn better. So when we compared against presenting no explanation at all and measured uh, differences between pre-test and post-test uh, results, we were seeing that people were gaining 3% increase uh, in their scores. So just getting a you know, chance to rethink the problem, I think, you know, still gave them some uh, increase in their scores. And when they were seeing the instructor-generated uh, explanation, which is, I guess, you know, somewhat of an ideal case or the, the standard case, we're seeing 9% 9, 9 increase. And with access, we're seeing 12% increase. So between these two conditions, it was not statistically significantly different, but there were certainly cases where access was picking explanations from learners that were even more uh, uh, powerful uh, than the instructor-generated ones. So in this system, if we were to take a more model-centric approach, I think we might have built an AI that automatically generates high-quality quality explanations. But instead, in taking an interaction-centric approach, I think the system we created is basically this co-learning system where the user, the learner, and AI are learning at the same time in a single system. So it's sort of an you know, education-focused uh, system of uh, the game with a purpose kind of setting where organic uh, benefits are provided to people who are interacting with the system, and the system is learning something useful out of it. And this is uh, basically the mechanism that we have in that both sides are learning and explanation and feedback are establishing this loop. And this is the topic of my PhD thesis and I explore this in the concept of learner sourcing where you know, learners as a crowd coming into the system are basically doing this by getting their individual benefits while they're providing something useful for the system to learn um, and do its thing better. So since then, I've been expanding uh, this idea to a broad uh, array of applications. So for example, can we use this kind of co-learning ideas to summarize uh, how-to videos in terms of like steps and sub-steps? Or building a concept map out of an instructional video that shows relationships uh, between different concepts? Or helping learners come up with the solution plans uh, in algorithmic problem solving settings? And other researchers have taken on this idea in different application contexts as well. So I think we can try to really generalize this kind of uh, idea of co-learning uh, system design in different contexts. All right, uh, moving on to the third challenge is about beyond a single user. And often uh, we think about a single user, a single AI interacting with each other in real life it would be much more complex and there would be diverse configurations. So how can we consider these social dynamics? And there could be various types of social dynamics, uh, but one specific instance that we did in was group-based, chat-based discussion in a group. So we built this system called Solution Chat, where the idea is what if this AI agent could recommend real-time moderation messages uh, to a group. So let's say a group is discussing you know, what to do for the uh, company retreat uh, next week, and they're having a discussion. The system, in real time, based on the understanding of the discussion context, and also knowing what kind of messages would be useful for the group, based on our sort of uh, literature survey of discussion um, and discussion-based education, 
it presents uh, these recommendation messages like uh, any more ideas or can you uh, can this uh, person uh, share their opinions you have been quiet for a while or should we try to uh, move on to the next uh, stage or thank you for your opinion so these kinds of moderation messages are presented by the system in real time just like what you get in like smart replies in Gmail, for example. And as a moderator, you, you can just choose to uh, you know, accept any of the messages that you like and discard the ones that you don't like. So a quick summary of the results of what we um, saw was that in our lab study with 55 uh, learner, uh, users in 12 different groups, when we compared uh, how many moderation messages were used in different groups, when we compared the baseline condition without these real-time recommendations versus solution chat our system, we're seeing a significant increase in the number of moderation messages that were present uh, in the chat stream in the solution chat condition. But interestingly, you can see that the users manually typed uh, moderation messages were actually decreasing in solution chat, but many of them were replaced by uh, the accepting uh, AI-generated recommendations. And furthermore, we had a, you know, this great opportunity to actually release this system to over 2,000 real-world users in a corporate education setting. So during COVID, a lot of these corporate education programs moved online, and this company that we worked with uh, wanted to uh, use this kind of you know, system to moderate hundreds of uh, chat rooms uh, that were doing uh, discussion-based um, uh, activity. And not surprisingly, just like the, the you know, very first uh, live stream prompt example that I mentioned, here again, people were collaboratively trying to understand uh, the capabilities and limitations of AI when they were first presented with the system. So they were you know, using the chat to test different messages, often you know, things that they believe would be not working, uh, and they would be sharing the results of, you know, oh, this is working, this is not working, I think this is does this well, but not that well. And it seems as if, you know, as a group does this kind of testing in the very first phase of their uh, usage of the system, people have this shared expectation of the system. And that seems to sort of determine their further interactions uh, with the system. And it's, it was also notable how different groups had different expectations based on their limited experimentation that they did in the beginning. And there were some interesting social dynamics that we observed as well, uh, like in how people use these AI recommendations uh, to socially interact with, with each other. Some people were using AI as proxy. So one of the quotes that we had was, I didn't want to directly ask the person to stop talking. So the person relied on the AI recommended message to kind of send it. They still chose to send it, but it was, their way of kind of softening uh, the potential sort of uh, dispute uh, with the person. Other people were using AI as a reference. So what we were seeing is that it was a fairly simple technical pipeline that we had. So it was a, just a like canned response. So people were sometimes uh, not really fond of the tone of the message, style of the message that we showed. So the person said, I found no fun in the recommended messages because all the messages look the same. So in those cases, what people did was they still adopted the idea from the recommendation, but then wrote it, rewrote it um, so that it's more, feels more personal and it feels more like it's coming from them, not AI. In other cases, AI seems to be adding a social burden. So in this uh, excerpt, so one of the people said, uh, I'm doubtful about the credibility of AI. And then the moderator picks this AI recommendation. Thanks for your opinion. And another person says, I also think negatively. Thanks for your opinion. Uh, thanks for sharing a good opinion. Shall we go to the next topic? And then the moderator realizes he might have you know, clicked uh, accept way too many times and it was a little unnatural. So he stopped to kind of uh, clarify and apologize. Uh, for, you know, sorry for my unnatural words as I'm using AI recommendations. So while we were seeing how people were saving their time and you know, cognitive effort in moderation could have decreased, it might have actually introduced uh, other types of burden at the same time. Again, so if we were to build this kind of system in a more model-centric manner, 
I think a good alternative might have been automated discussion moderation, where AI would actually do all the moderation by itself. But instead, we chose to take a more AI-assisted uh, moderation for obvious reasons. Users want to have more agency and control, and they wanted to keep their style of communication. So instead of, you know, handing over the entire control to AI, uh, we still sort of gave that control to the human moderator uh, who could kind of uh, use it uh, as an additional resource. Okay, so there was a third challenge. And moving on to the final challenge of supporting sustainable engagement. Here the concern is that uh, we want to think beyond this you know, single session usage and over time, you know, how people react to these systems might change, their mental model might change, and how AI actually works might change. So we need to really think about this temporal dimension more carefully. And for this uh, uh, thread, uh, we investigated in the context of uh, novices making changes to uh, websites that they're seeing. So for example, you might have a case where you visited this website, uh, the colors hurt your eyes, or you couldn't really find this button or tap it uh, because it's too small, maybe you want to make it larger. Um, but then people without expertise in HTML and CSS have difficulty doing this. So we thought uh, by leveraging the power of large language models and so on, maybe we can support more natural language queries. So if a person says, tone down the text, the system can kind of display these uh, style recommendations that they can explore and select from um, that are about toning down the text. So the way the system works is if the user clicks and says, uh, make this larger, the system presents a set of uh, design attributes that are about uh, making something larger. And the user can say, emphasize this part, it's something somewhat ambiguous, right? There isn't a clear single design attribute that is about emphasis, right? So it presents these uh, few recommendations that are about uh, emphasizing something. So we built this by establishing this uh, NLP pipeline and computer vision pipeline. Uh, on the NLP side, what it does is uh, analyzing the user's query and turning, uh, mapping them uh, with the style attributes that seem to be connected to what the user's intent uh, is about. In terms of computer vision, we collected millions of uh, web design uh, elements um, to determine a good set of recommendations to show uh, to the learner. So by combining those, we built this system. Again, so instead of going deep into the technical details of the system, I want to focus on the interaction dynamics. So we ran this user study with 40 people where we presented them with either Stylet, which is the name of our system, versus the baseline, the Chrome developer tools, which is sort of the standard tool for making these uh, style changes. So we compared these two groups. Uh, and we gave people two tasks. One is a well-defined task where the, we ask people to turn this before image into an after image. And then secondly, we had this open-ended task where we gave this blank slate and people were able to make any kind of change that they want. First, I want to uh, share success stories. People were more successful in completing these design tasks when using Stylet. Like 80% of the Stylet users completed the task as opposed to only 35% uh, in Chrome developer tools. And these were complete novices in web design, like no experience at all. And people completed the task in 35% less time, so it was efficient uh, to use Stylet. Another interesting observation was that people were making the same similar number of changes in both conditions, but in Stylet condition, people were making more diverse uh, changes, which means that it probably had to do with how Stylet shows these you know, multiple options for people to explore, and there was a conscious decision to not just show the most obvious one, uh, but show somewhat related ones as well, so that people could explore and tinker around different options. But then an unexpected finding was when we looked at people's self-confidence. Because we thought this kind of system would be useful for people's uh, learning of the skills and confidence that they have about the skills, we asked people's self-confidence uh, after each task. What we noted was that after the first task, in both conditions, people's uh, self-confidence increased. 
But then in the second task, after the second task, users' self-confidence decreased for styled, while in the developer tool, it kept increasing. Why would that be the case? And we were seeing many cases where styled users were frustrated that the only control that they had was natural language. Now they have some grasp of how it works. They wanted to do more fine-grained control more directly, and they wanted more specific things, but because they only had natural language, uh, they sometimes just uh, got frustrated. Whereas in the Chrome Developer Tools condition, people were just happy that they accomplished something uh, with their own hands. And I think that you know, kind of uh, is presented as a continued increase in self-confidence. And we know from you know, HCI and like from uh, CS147 that you know, people's expert expertise and learnability uh, really matters. And as they have more knowledge of the you know, domain and the skill, they might need to get more advanced controls or being able to more directly manipulate uh, what they're working on. So I think this uh, had some interesting lessons in terms of thinking about the temporal dimension in that learners are changing. And other researchers have been reporting that you know, considering these uh, temporal dynamics is important. On the left, what you see is uh, you know, design researchers who have shown that there are these different stages of relationship that people have in technologies like self-tracking devices. First, they would start with initiation and experimentation, uh, followed by intensifying and integration, and then stagnation and termination. And one of the design lessons might be that uh, these might be more meta-level factors that sh really should be considered in designing these systems. In that, uh, you know, even the same kind of intervention might need to be presented in different manners, depending on what stage you are or what your expectation is with the system. On the right, what you're seeing is the guidelines for human AI interaction, really influential work uh, from Amershi et al. And they organize these guidelines for human AI interaction in different categories, but that are organized in the temporal sort of uh, aspect, like initial encounter with AI during interaction, when things go wrong, and over time. So taking into account this temporal dimension um, can really be powerful in supporting more sustainable engagement. And the related question might be, as people are relying on relying more on these AI tools, like grammar fixes or you know, even generating text, it's important to think about how people's mental model would change over time. And AI also changes over time too. And do we hit a point where people become maybe overly reliant in that maybe their grammar skills or writing skills do not you know, improve anymore, but then without the tool, they actually might perform worse? And what, what is that dynamic? Or maybe over-reliance is perfectly fine because if we believe these tools will be around the user all the time, maybe it's just the final outcome that matters. And I think we need more studies and you know, analysis of the long-term engagement of users using these kind of uh, technologies. Um, and to kind of sum up, if we were to take a more model-centric approach here, I think we might have built a system that makes automatic uh, design fixes to optimize a, a web page uh, directly. And the system makes a fix and user can just use it. But instead, we took a more sort of interaction-centric route where we ask people to do sort of uh, you know, style change by themselves as the system was presenting these recommendations and they still had to do the fix by themselves. But what we expected here was that people can then customize by seeing these uh, attributes, they can learn, they can discover new ways of doing things, they can tinker around, which can uh, empower them, especially in the more learning context, although the temporal dimension has to be more carefully taken into account. So these were the four challenges that I wanted to uh, share today. And to kind of wrap up, I just wanted to pose two questions moving forward uh, from the uh, interaction-centric perspective uh, as HCI researchers. So first is, how might we design these building blocks and interface affordances for new and upcoming AI models? Okay, um, so I think part of it is that instead of you know, building these point solutions, I think we need to think about, are there any sort of generalizable like frameworks, libraries, widgets, or interface affordances uh, that we could come up with uh, as, as a community that is really good at these kinds of things? And the second question is, does AI really require us to 
have these new things? I mean, can we just use existing uh, design elements and you know frameworks to build AI applications? And I tend to think that uh, we might need something new uh, for these uh, new and upcoming AI models, especially because they have these very different characteristics than the conventional systems that we have been building. They're more probabilistic, harder to predict, more black box in nature, yet seemingly more impactful and powerful in terms of what they do. Hallucinating, right? All these properties packed together, I think we might really need to think about what, what are the types of interaction affordances that are really uh, built for supporting um, the usability of these uh, AI-powered applications. So in this, I think uh, as a community, we are making all these great advances, like making different types of contributions. And you know, I tend to focus on more sort of uh, interactive systems and techniques, uh, well, uh, whereas other people focus on like introducing new design processes and understandings. And I think all this work is needed. And you know, some of the interesting examples of you know, adding sort of an interaction layer um, to these uh, new types of models is in this example, Tailbrush, where the user can kind of draw the level of fortune that they want in the character to have when they use uh, generative models to generate a uh, story. Or this AI chains work, uh, which uh, presents these uh, primitives and workflows for uh, putting together uh, this workflow that can accomplish more complex tasks uh, with uh, these LLM prompts that a single prompt cannot really perform. And in my research group uh, with my PhD student, Tesu Kim, we have been investigating uh, this idea of what will be more generalizable design framework. And thinking about like input, model, and output, we have been thinking about the concepts of cells, generators, and lenses, and try to sort of introduce this uh, standardized libraries and widgets that people can easily adopt in their AI applications. So for example, using this, this kind of framework, people can build a copywriting app, email app or story writing app using pretty much the same kind of framework which can save people's time while supporting uh, the types of interactions like iterations and comparison and experimenting uh, different outputs. And the second question um, and the final question that I want to ask today is how might we as an HCI community collaborate better with the AI community? on these various things. And it was also the discussion that I was having a lot with uh, today's meetings uh, and also with various AI researchers, especially at NeurIPS. And in terms of community collaboration, of course, one of the important things is metrics. And there was also a great discussion at the HCII conference a couple of weeks ago, hosted here at Stanford. Um, and in the AI community, you know, it cares a lot about model performance and generalization errors where in HCI, we tend to focus on the human experience. So how do we really bridge the gap between the metrics? And what it means to do AI research with more human side metrics incorporated? What's the incentive for people to do that? And how do we encourage more AI people to kind of use these metrics too? And in terms of human input design, a lot of the, the comments that I was getting in terms of interaction-centric AI from AI researchers is that these ideas are great, but then I don't really know how to actually take action about it. And part of it is, you know, in their model building kind of work, you know, how can, can I incorporate human feedback and how do I use it in a meaningful way to really change the way the model actually works rather than just, you know, getting a more high-level design guidance. So you know, one great uh, direction for this might be think about more like you know, making human uh, feedback more computationally feasible so that this compatibility uh, is actually satisfied. And lastly, we need to think about the change in design process as well. And in a lot of, uh, this is Stanford D School's uh, user-centered design uh, cycle. And I think in a lot of the AI research, what we're seeing is this prototype test kind of culture. You try something new, test it, iteratively improve it. But then one, one of the frustrations is that interaction often comes too late, right? There's this new cool model and can you build an UI on top of it is sort of the uh, kind of discourse we get a lot. Uh, and I think interaction should not just be like an icing on the cake, but really something that can guide the entire design process or help people determine is this the 
right problem to tackle in the first place? Or what, what kind of interaction should we try to support with AI? And based on that, think of what AI should do and should not do and how much AI should be used in a particular context. So that's, uh, that's all I wanted to share. And here's a summary of what I mentioned today. And I'd be uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. So I'll check my uh, recommendations of facilitating messages. If there are any more ideas. No? No other recommendations? What do you think? <laughs> really sounded like an AI. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll just click them all. I, I want to pull the, oh, I should, I should make the mic on. I, I want to I wanna pull the thread a little bit on this notion of how to connect human feedback with the objective functions that you touched on near the end. Because that, that's been rattling around in my head the, in much of the talk that you're giving that, you know, if I think about what should AI researchers be doing differently, then you're sort of asking, well, what's the proper model of the person in their, in their system, right? And traditionally, the problem has been that human interaction is really expensive. Right, just to collect annotated data, or once you have it, to be able to kind of tune the model. Right, that it it you don't get that much of it, and so they often fall back on self supervision, or as you as you've been talking about in the value alignment, they sort of train an RL model to mimic a human, and then you know let that go loose. And it seems like until you know, I think they're kind of. I want you to take a position on one of the two positions. One either is to say, look, we need to find strategies like that where we can create you know proxy humans and that's how we hook into their uh, in, into the objective functions the loss function etc the other alternative would be to say no that we're gonna find some other way to actually pr make human feedback you know at a scale and in a form that they can directly use in the models I'm just curious like if if you want to take a bet where's your bet on that where should we be heading? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I would say, uh, I mean, you asked me to take a position, but I would say both will be prevalent. And I, I like the latter approach much more. And I think that's more promising and sustainable. And for example, the reason I'm really interested in this uh, like whole learning uh, feedback loop between the human and the machine is that you know even if this super advanced AI comes along and let's say it presents this uh, like super accurate explanations, people's self-explanation activity is still meaningful, right? Because that that's how they could learn. And so I feel like, you know, we, we can't really try to find uh, these compatible uh, mechanisms in which uh, the human can get the benefit and get the incentive for doing what they are really good at and what is helpful for them, not necessarily trying to help the system or you know, getting paid to system, paid to, to uh, support the system per se. Um, and at the same time, the system can use it for something meaningful. And on the system side, I think in the system like Axis that I presented, uh, I was really happy when we landed at this technical solution where people's rating uh, data could be almost directly piped into the feedback uh, for the RL agent to kind of uh, use as meaningful feedback. So I think that's just one example where this kind of worked out for this kind of context. And I think we need to really investigate more and think about are there many any like generalizable uh, mechanisms that this kind of approach could work in different contexts. This assumes that you have a large set of users you can draw on. There are learners that are coming through your system. If I'm early on in the pipeline and I just kind of have V0, I don't have the users yet, are there other strategies you would recommend? Yeah, yeah, excellent. Uh, so in, in, in that same access system, for instance, what we did was to uh, insert the uh, instructor-generated explanations as sort of the initial seed. Um, and I was also imagining maybe using LLMs, for instance, we can uh, plug in AI-generated ones to kind of avoid the cold start problem. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be interesting to see how, you know, in the same system, like AI-generated ones, uh, instructor-generated ones, and learner-generated ones can kind of compete against each other until the system ultimately just focuses on what is best for right. learners. This is kind of a two-part question, um, going back to the like third challenge or like project you talked about, um, where there was that note about AI as proxy, like people kind of using that as 
like an excuse to make points where maybe they wanted to do something but didn't want it to come off as them. Um, so the, the first part of the question is like in that case, did people want to, um, later it says people wanted the message to kind of sound like them, but in the, the case of the AI as proxy, did they want that to sound like them or were they wanting it to sound more artificial? And then second part of the question is, do you think there are more situations than just this where maybe we don't want the AI to feel super personable and maybe want the interaction to feel slightly more kind of mechanical or unnatural? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I would say these were somewhat different use cases uh, and both I think are valuable in Smite. Um, and, and that again, I think in a more model centric approach, we also kind of focus on trying to create these messages that are more like humans. And that could be effective in certain cases, but as you said, that might not really be what the users want because you know, in a proxy kind of setting, you might not actually want it to sound too personalized, right? Because you know, maybe the more canned message might actually work better in that context um, and, and vice versa. So I think, uh, yeah, like just being able to like identify all these different needs that people have and expectations that people have and being able to somewhat fluidly support those, I think was really an interesting kind of uh, uh, observation that we had. And I think moving forward, uh, you know, one of the lessons was that, you know, this like more personalizable uh, message generation could be an interesting technology that could be potentially integrated, but that's not going to solve everything because there are these other types of needs that will not be supported uh, even with the perfect uh, personalizable uh, style transfer. Um, so, yeah. Explaining stuff, I, I kept thinking about um, how what you described and sort of the challenges that we see with this uh, new deep, deep networks uh, and, and models and how we interact with them are similar to how people used to interact with search engines, right? At the beginning, people we're not as good as sort of figuring out how to query the search engine right. And over time, both the, we became better at querying the search engines and then the search engines became better at sort of understanding how to interpret user queries. Do you see any similarities there? Do you, is there something that's very unique to the challenges we face with these new models? Or is it just that we haven't had enough time to sort of adopt to each other in a way, um, yeah. Excellent, yeah, and I think it's a recurring theme, you know, as these new uh, technologies come in, uh, initially people would kind of you know, struggle and they would need to learn how it actually works through trial and error and lots of, uh, you know, like failed attempts. And that's what we're seeing with these, like ChatGPT, for instance, a lot of people are trying things out, reporting yeah. success and failure cases. Um, so I do think there are certain similarities. Um, when it comes to more, what, what's more unique about what we're seeing right now is that uh, due to the nature of like how black box, complex, unpredictable these models are, I think it just confuses people much more. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a question of, you know, is this really like a human learning problem to begin with, right? So if people take, do it more, and you know, if they had more time, mm -hmm. will will people be actually able to really get to a point where they could really easily create something that they like? Probably not. Yeah. Right. So that's why I think we need uh, both on the model side to kind of think about what are more interactable and, and learnable ways of you know architecting these kind of models in the first place, and also from the HCI point of view, what are what are these uh, interaction mechanisms that could be uh, added to these models in a way that it is actually more understandable and, and usable on the user side. Yeah, thanks so much, yeah. I think we're at about a time, but Juho will be here for a couple minutes after the talk for further questions. So let's thank him for speaking. Thank you.